Thanks, Michelle. You're watching South East Today, our top story tonight. Nearly 10 years behind bars for the asylum seeker who piloted a small boat which sank, killing four fellow migrants. We've got reaction from our reporter at Canterbury Crown Court. Almost two years on, the suffering continues for thousands of Ukrainian refugees forced to flee their country. In my soul, I hope that it's over soon. This war will finish soon. The NHS prepares for five more days of disruption as junior doctors prepare to go on strike over pay. And talent spotting, young weightlifters get the chance to show what they're made of at a national competition in Kent. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Ellie Crissell, an asylum seeker at the helm of an inflatable dinghy that sank in the channel, resulting in at least four deaths, has been sentenced to nine and a half years behind bars. In a landmark case, Ibrahim Abar was found guilty of causing the deaths of his fellow migrants through gross negligence manslaughter. The judge at Canterbury Crown Court said the boat was a death trap leading to utter tragedy. But supporters of Barr insist he was also a victim of ruthless people smugglers, as Nick Johnson reports. On a cold winter's night in the middle of the English Channel, cries for help. Dozens of asylum seekers battle to stay afloat after their dinghy became overwhelmed by water. At least four died. Their pilot, Ibrahim Abar, seen here in blue, detained for nine and a half years for their manslaughter. Bar from Senegal agreed to pilot the boat in exchange for a free crossing. During the trial, Bar claimed he had misgivings about the vessel, the remains of which are seen here saying it was too small for the number of people and that people smugglers assaulted him and threatened him with death if he didn't steer the boat. He could have gone out in the boat for a small distance if he was in fear and then gone back um, because it was too dangerous in his opinion. The, 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 the people smugglers wouldn't have hung around on the beach. Mr Justice Johnson described the inflatable as a death trap with no life jackets, no tools, no lights and no first aid kits. He went on. He said what happened is an utter tragedy for those who died and their families. And to Ibrahim Abar, Mr Justice Johnson said, this is also a tragedy for you. Your dream of starting a new life here in the UK is in tatters. The judge also said he accepted that the gangs of people smugglers bear primary responsibility and that Ibrahim Abar played no part in the organisation of the trip. This case is the first in which a migrant who navigated an inflatable has been found responsible for harm caused to other occupants. This man is clearly not a people trafficker or part of any gang. We are concerned. This is obviously the first person in this situation who has been taken to trial. Um, we we'd hope that we don't see more. A 31-year-old man from Afghanistan was one of the passengers who died. He left behind a wife and six-year-old daughter. The judge said other families continue to suffer the additional anguish of not knowing whether their loved one's body has been recovered. Well, let's speak to Nick now. He's at Canterbury Crown Court for us this evening. Nick, Ibrahim Abar was young, isn't he? So he'll begin his sentence in a, in a young offenders institution. That's right. There is some confusion around Ibrahim Abar's age, some mystery. The judge saying sentencing him today as if he was about 20 years old. It means Barr will serve the first bit of his sentence in a young offenders institute before being moved to adult custody when he's 21. Now, the judge said Barr had always dreamed of a life in the UK and had a traumatic journey from West Africa, including another small boat crossing lasting five days between Libya and Italy, in which Barr and other passengers also had to be rescued. The judge made reference to the fact that the English Channel is the busiest shipping lane in the world and the number of crossings have increased between 2019 and 2022. He said with such high numbers of crossings and such unseaworthy vessels, catastrophes such as this are bound to happen. Nick, thank you. 
Administrative staff at the East Kent Hospital's NHS Trust have been warned they could face redundancy. Jobs could go as managers try to improve the Trust's financial position with a deficit of more than £100 million forecast this year. They say they're hoping to avoid compulsory redundancies and will provide support to colleagues affected by the restructuring programme. Police say an investigation into the death of a man at a holiday park in East Sussex has ended without charges. Seven people were arrested on suspicion of murder following the death of Michael Madonna at Park Dean Resort in Camber Sands in 2022, but all seven have been released and will face no further action. Tomorrow marks the second anniversary of the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. Thousands of Ukrainian refugees who fled to the southeast after the Russian invasion have decided to go home. But for most, it's still too dangerous to return. As Fiona Irving reports, charities say many Ukrainians here are struggling to find work and secure accommodation. Hi, Tanya. Hello, Oh, it's so good to see you. Reuniting with the family who offered her sanctuary. You look like you're in the south of France. It looks very beautiful. Well, I found a place, it's cafe, yeah. but it's empty. Titania is now back in Odessa. But as the war started, she fled with her son, sister and nephew. All uh, women, we wanted just to have uh, this safety place for our children. She found refuge at Helen's home in Eastbourne. But homesick and unable to find work as a pharmacist, she returned to Ukraine after five months. Last night, as the air raid sirens kept her awake, not for the first time she questioned whether it was the right decision to return. They sent drones, rockets, and this night, in the midst of a terrible, they destroyed just civilian buildings with flat and soldiers and just civilians. People die every day. And her host, Helen, says the family are welcome back at any time. It was an emotional journey that I'm absolutely thrilled I had with them. And, you know, they, they are our friends now. They're, they're not going out of our lives. Since the war began, the South East has welcomed more than 12,700 Ukrainian refugees under the Homes for Ukraine scheme. One in three of those on the scheme here are still living with sponsors. A fifth have since returned to war-torn Ukraine. Elena escaped to Eastbourne with her two young daughters, leaving her husband back in Lviv. She now works for a recruitment company and feels part of this Sussex community. So the hardest bit, I think, was taking the decision to leave. And um, just you pack all your life in this one suitcase and take your children and then leave. Go through quite a difficult journey. But then when we arrived here, it was a kind of a relief. But settling at the beginning, that wasn't um, an easy thing to do. The South East opened its arms to Ukrainian refugees. Those that stayed and those that returned say they're grateful for the refuge. And as the second anniversary of Putin's invasion approaches, they also urge us not to forget the plight of their homeland. Not yellow. Bye bye. Bye. Well, Fiona is live in Eastbourne for us this evening. Hello, Fiona. Tomorrow the town is marking this second anniversary, isn't it? Yes, Ellie, tomorrow the 24th of February marks two years since Russia's full-scale invasion. It began at dawn, an air and ground campaign with some of Russia's rockets reaching as far west as Lviv. Well, tomorrow in Eastbourne, a place, as you saw in my report, where many Ukrainian refugees still live. Many will be standing next to their flag in solidarity. And there'll also in the evening be a candlelit vigil at the town hall. Ellie, speaking to Ukrainians here in Eastbourne today, they are hugely grateful for the support this community has shown them, but they're desperate to get back to a peaceful Ukraine and rebuild their community and they're desperate that Western support for its fight still continues. Indeed. Fiona, thank you. 
Kent police are appealing for dash cam footage following a fatal collision on the M20 motorway. A man in his 30s who was on foot was hit by a lorry this morning on the coastbound carriageway which was closed for several hours between Ashford and Hythe. There are flood alerts across Kent, Sussex and Surrey this evening plus one more serious flood warning for Barker Mills near Lewis. The Environment Agency is warning that some roads there are likely to become impassable because of high water levels on the River Ouse. Further heavy rainfall is forecast over the weekend. Junior doctors are preparing to go on strike again, calling for a 35% pay rise as part of a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The five-day walkout will start at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning and continue until midnight on Wednesday evening. Once again, across the southeast, there is likely to be disruption for patients as staff are moved from their usual roles to cover emergency departments. Our health correspondent, Mark Norman, is here. Hello, Mark. The NHS is is still reeling from from the last junior doctor's strike, is it not? Yes, absolutely. The impact of that January strike was significant. And I think we can expect the same again with this five day strike. When I say significant across the southeast, more than 10,000 working days were lost due to the junior doctor's industrial action last month. On top of that, more than 13,300 outpatient appointments had to be cancelled and rescheduled and almost 1,500 inpatient operations were cancelled and rebooked. That will just inevitably lead to a larger and larger backlog and people waiting for the care that they need. Um, and, and there isn't a way around that. We don't have a spare NHS somewhere that we can bring out of the cupboard uh, and do that activity. So, you know, I feel dreadfully sorry for people who are having their planned care postponed. So let's take a closer look at the impact the January strike had on two of our NHS trusts. The University Hospital Sussex Trust is one of the largest in the southeast, responsible for hospitals in Worthing, Chichester, Brighton and Haywards Heath. Junior doctors taking part in the walkout missed the equivalent of 705 working days. Across those four hospitals, more than 1,200 outpatient appointments were cancelled and 54 operations had to be postponed. At Dartford and Gravesham, a smaller NHS trust which runs the Darren Valley Hospital, almost 600 working days were lost to strike action last month. Managers there had to cancel nearly 500 outpatient appointments and were forced to reschedule more than 180 operations. But despite that, the BMA believe they still have public support. 53% of people support us in our pursuit for restoring our pay. And I think that's reflected in the fact that the majority of people in this country understand that there are significant issues with trying to get to see your doctor, whether that's in your GP surgery or whether that's for your consultant appointment. Now the government say if the doctors call off the strike, they will begin negotiations. But the doctors' union leaders want what they call a credible pay offer before calling off their action. They're going to ballot members about more strike action later this year, Ellie. Thank you, Mark. It's uh, quarter to seven. This is our top story tonight. A young asylum seeker at the helm of an inflatable dinghy that sank in the channel, resulting in at least four deaths, has been sentenced to nine and a half years behind bars for gross negligence manslaughter. The judge described the vessel as a death trap. Also in tonight's programme, Waiting in the wings, a chance for young heavyweights to show what they're made of as a national youth competition comes to Kent. And today we had some torrential downpours. We'll keep the showers in the forecast for the weekend as it's going to be much chillier as well. I've got the details later on in the programme. The family of a Sussex teenager whose candid video diary charting her battle with cancer gained thousands of online followers say the charity created in her memory has raised almost £300,000. Tomorrow marks the eighth anniversary of Charlotte Eade's death from a rare and aggressive brain tumour. The money raised in her name is funding pioneering research at King's College Hospital in London. And as Peter Whittlesey has been finding out, scientists there believe they're on the brink of a treatment breakthrough. Hi, my name's Charlotte Eads. I'm just like any other typical teenage girl, but I have a twist. The twist is, is that I have cancer. 
It's a brave up close and personal vlog of Charlotte's cancer journey. A few weeks ago I was told that it looked like something was in my brain basically on the MRI scan there was some sort of uh, you know growth. From that point Charlotte's decline was rapid. Oh, you think so, JK, I'm doing the worst as in medication I was on isn't working very well. Her mum will never forget the moment they were told Charlotte's brain tumour was terminal. She just said, does that mean I'll never get married? Does that mean I'll never have children? So I said, yeah, I think that it does. And um, for my husband and my, my, both my son, and I just said, I'm telling you before we get back, that it's really bad news. Determined to make a difference, Charlotte's family set up a charity. It's funded a lab at King's College Hospital in London. The genetic makeup of tumours is now analysed, helping to improve prognosis and treatment. Scientists believe they're on the verge of completing these tests in hours rather than weeks, which will be a game changer for patients. Probably we can do this while the patient is still on operating theatre. And I can get the sample from the neurosurgeons and we do our, our test and we can tell what exactly the tumour and what's genetic modification. And this is a tumour and that will help the surgeons to modify their surgery, to change their way of doing things and to help to immediately uh, design the pathway for the good treatment and, and management of the patients. The genetics is key because it's the best indicator of the tumour's properties, for instance how aggressive it is or which drugs should be used. The genetic makeup of the tumour allows us to give a really specific diagnosis and it's that specific diagnosis that will allow us to um, give a more accurate prognosis and also hopefully um, allow us to find some actionable targets that we can actually target for treatment. And being part of these improvements in medical science is important for Charlotte's family. The charity um, keeps me going, keeping busy keeps me going, um, but knowing that we've actually made this tremendous advancement and working with such a fantastic bunch of people at King's has given me a lot of pleasure. And the team at King's says kick-starting genetic testing for tumours in the NHS and improving patient outcomes is Charlotte's legacy. Peter Whittlesey, BBC South East Today, Brighton. Now let's move on to our sports desk. We're starting with some of the strongest youngsters you're ever likely to see. Our sports reporter James Dunn is here to tell us more. James? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of the uh, best young weightlifters in the country have come to Maidstone today for the English Under-23 Championships. It's given added motivation to young athletes from the area, some of them already title holders, with the focus more on technique than weight for the younger lifters. And the sport's also attracting more girls at youth level than ever before. Making light work of nearly 100 kilos. When a competition as big as this comes to town, it carries weight and it means a great deal to the young lifters at the local club. I think it's something new that's coming to Maidstone. Weightlifting isn't overly a massive sport, so it just it brings something new to a different area. We're a little club in here, but there's a lot of members and it adds, adds a bit to the town. We've never ever had a competition in the south. It's always been up north. Um, so it's especially good for like, a lot of the kids that are going to be lifting their hometown, get a lot of local support there. Among those competing this weekend is Dylan, already a champion in the under 10s and hoping one day to go to the Olympics. I came first in my English championships and first in my British championships. This year I need to retain those titles. It's a challenge but it's a risk that you have to take. The club's seeing an influx of talented young girls in its ranks. She trains with kids of all ages, all the way through to the, the older kids and uh, young adults, as they are now. And I think she enjoys watching and learning from the others as much as she enjoys lifting herself. Here, athletes are dropping the macho image some associate with the sport. I just make weightlifting as girly as possible. I have a pink, pink sparkly lifting belt. I'm always fake tanned for my comps. You have nails on for them and just make it as girly as I can. Lots of young girls are now realising that being strong is actually quite cool. Um, it's great to have muscles and, you know, be quite athletic. So I think we are seeing a shift in that lots of girls from a younger age are now entering the sport. With dozens of events in different age groups across the weekend, the event's brought strong competition for local athletes and it's raising the bar for the town's talent. 
On to football now and some huge news for Brighton and Hove Albion. They've already been to Marseille, Amsterdam and Athens on their first ever European tour to face AS Roma in the Stadio Olimpico, a 70,000 seater stadium. It's hosted the Euros, the World Cup and if you're watching the Six Nations at the moment, it's where the Italian national team play and their manager, Daniel De Rossi, is a close friend of Roberto De Zerbi's. I like him because uh, he feels football like me. He has a big, big heart. He's a passionate um, person, and uh, we are uh, we are friends. But I hope to win. Anyway. Before that trip to Rome, Brighton are in Premier League action this weekend. The Seagulls host Everton at the Annex and in League Two we've got Crawley Town travelling to Accrington Stanley and Gillingham face Wrexham. All three games kick off at 3pm tomorrow. BBC Radio Sussex have full commentary of the Brighton game. Radio Kent have the Jills match. Well, this evening, uh, skeleton athlete Matt Weston from Crowborough has won a silver medal at the World Championships in Germany. He was the defending world champion and he hoped to be the first ever Brit to defend that title. Well, on his final heat today, he clocked a terrifying top speed of 131 kilometres per hour, but it wasn't quite enough. Even so, that silver medal means that he's only the second ever Brit to win multiple world championship medals after Kent's double Olympic champion, Lizzie. Yarnold. Before we go, if you're thinking about going for a walk on Brighton Seafront on Sunday, well you might hit traffic. There are around 10,000 runners taking part in the Brighton Half Marathon on Sunday, including former Wales international Gareth Thomas and reality TV star Arj from The Only Way Is Essex. We've had both of them on the programme over the last couple of weeks, so watch out for them and good luck to everybody taking part. And that's it for the sport. You fancy that on uh, Sunday, Ellie? I'll tell you what I do fancy is going to Rome to report on the Brighton <laughs> game, eh, James? All right for some? Thank you. Now, they came, they saw, they conquered some 2,000 years ago. In case you didn't know, the Romans were in charge here and their treasures are still being unearthed. Archaeologists say they've discovered an incredibly rare artefact during a dig in the Kent countryside near Tenterden. Claudia Sebasis has been to see the head of the Roman god, Mercury. Mercury, the messenger, the god of trade, travel, trickery and believed by the Romans to be the deity who will guide you to the underworld. The discovery of the figurine is a, is a really uh, rare uh, discovery because there are less than 10 of these kinds of mercury pipe clay figurines found in the whole of Roman Britain. The male mercury gods are really rare. Um, they're found in different kinds of contexts, so in domestic contexts, in people's houses, uh, sometimes in temples and sometimes as a whole figure in graves of uh, often sick children. When the Romans invaded Britain around 2,000 years ago, they affected our language, culture, geography and architecture. He's quite worn, our little figure, and you can see that he's broken. So one of his horns has broken off here. One side of his face is, is sort of damaged as well. Um, so if there was any paint, it's long gone. Um, we don't seem to have any surface adhering that would hold uh, any paint. He's got such a delicate nose. He has got a delicate nose, yeah. Quite a beauty, isn't he? Yeah, he's quite a little character. Small Hythe Place has been the subject of investigations for several years by archaeologists. And it's not just the Romans who lived here. There are four levels of history here. This is the house that the actress Ellen Terry lived in in the Victorian times. Before that, it was a working farm. And then the evidence of a medieval shipyard and, of course, the Romans. It's time to begin the hunt for what seems to me like the biggest mystery of all. How on earth could ships built at Small Hive possibly have sailed out to the sea, which is now 10 miles away? We wanted to dig here because we wanted to follow up on some work that had been done in the 1990s by Time Team, where they would looked at the medieval shipyard. What's particularly uh, unique about Small Hive is that that medieval uh, period is so well preserved in the landscape. Victorian bottles, medieval shipyard fittings, Roman pottery. From next week, the pipe clay mercury would join them on display. Claudia Sebasis, BBC South East Today, Small Hive.
incredible now. It looks a bit chilly down there with Claudia. What does the weather have in store for us this weekend, Nina? Well, it's not going to be raining all the time, but there is still some rain in the forecast. We had a pretty wet couple of days, and today it was a story of some torrential downpours, big hailstones with those showers, and a pretty amount of cloud as well. But we did see some glimmers of blue sky as well. So it's a pretty mixed picture as far as the weather's concerned. The weekend stays chilly. We're looking at overnight frost and through the day a scattering of showers so we will see some drier spells in between. Today's showers will clear away for most of us. We might just keep one or two going along the south coast but temperatures will dip just below freezing. A slight frost with lows of minus one degrees. So that chilly start to the morning but it should be dry for many of us with some early sunshine. As we go through the day, the showers start to build. They start off again along the south coast, then become a little more widespread. Not everywhere we'll see them, but they could be some heavy downpours at times. And our afternoon highs, staying in single figures, we've got around eight or nine degrees as our top temperature on Saturday afternoon. But through the evening, we'll lose the showers and for much of the night into Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, it should be dry with again those clear spells. So temperatures falling below freezing for some of us. We're looking at another slight frost on Sunday morning. For Sunday, again, it's the first part of the day where we'll see the best of any dry and maybe a little bit of brightness. But quite quickly through the morning on Sunday, the cloud increases. The rain is quite patchy and light to begin with, but through the afternoon, that rain becomes steadily heavier and more extensive with temperatures struggling. So we're saying at around seven to eight for most of us. Now, that's a weather system that's coming in from the west, this area of low pressure. It sort of spirals across us through Sunday and into Monday, keeping things wet for Monday. But then a change into Tuesday, a window of dry weather. That's just a ridge of high pressure pushing its way in. But you'll see weather fronts aren't too far away. So it does continue to stay unsettled throughout much of next week. So it's a chilly weekend. We could see some overnight frost. There'll be a bit of rain at times with a scattering of showers and the outlook is still looking pretty unsettled, Ellie. But it is spring next week, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Very exciting. Thank you very much, Nina. That is it from me and from Nina and from everyone else. Piers Hopkirk is back at 10.30. Bye.